Okay. So uh, this evening, I want to talk about a, um, a mansion in Bowie, Maryland, uh, that I worked on actually some years ago now, uh, pretty much in the 1990s. Uh, but it hasn't, uh, hasn't seen the light of day in the last 20 years or so. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about it. And this is the site. This is the site in 1990 when I first started working there. This is a, a, a mansion occupied by three governors, Maryland governors. And uh, you might get the sense in the photograph, apart from the fact that it's black and white, that the place is looking a little bit ragged. And the plan was to restore this building and turn it into a museum and a reception center. And uh, the city of Bowie has done just that. So I'm gonna tell you the story about the folks who live there and about how this place changed and about how archeology span tells us something about those changes. Uh, it's, it was occupied, it was built for and occupied largely by the Ogle family, O-G-L-E, a uh, prominent Prince George's County family. Uh, it was essentially their, um, it was a working plantation. They made money uh, with it but it was also sort of a retreat for the family. Most of the time, the family lived in town in what is now called Ogle Hall, uh, which is the, um, the digs for the uh, Naval Academy Alumni Association. So this is right on King George's Street in Annapolis. Um, places there are still being used, but this is essentially their townhouse. A lot of the wealthy, uh, really prominent planters in Maryland in the 18th and early 19th centuries, had both a plantation and a townhouse. And the townhouse is particularly useful during the season, that is after um, the harvest and the winter ho holidays to, uh, uh, come about. And so the wealthy folks get together, live in their townhouses in town, hardy hardy. Uh, if you've seen any Jane Austen uh, films or, you know, movies of that like based on novels of people like Jane Austen, you're familiar with this. <clears throat> on public broadcasting recently, they've had uh, the uncompleted novel Sanditon, and that's really a lot about this uh, off-season uh, people congregating in town uh, where you get to have fun, you meet a lot of folks, and you get to find mates for your sons and daughters. So this is a photograph of um, Bel Air Mansion uh, after it was restored. And a couple of things I wanna draw your attention to. Uh, first of all, you know, we've got the main block of the mansion. That was built in the mid 1740s, but it also has these little hyphens and wings. So an L, uh, a hyphen connects the main house with these wing additions. This makes it a classic five-part Palladian structure uh, based on Roman ideals, uh, very popular among the wealthy from oh, probably about 1740 to about time of the American Revolution. In, uh, on, and this, this is the rear side, what we would consider the rear side of the building. And you can see these uh, grass covered terraces. Also very popular with the elite of that time. And it wouldn't be covered with grass, it would be covered probably with ornate gardens, uh, lots of exotic plants. Uh, it, you get a wonderful view from the house looking out across those terraces and they're designed so they kind of um, narrow a little bit uh, as you get further from the house and that creates the illusion that the prospect you're looking at is much greater than it really is. Off to the left, in amongst these trees, is the family cemetery. And I'll show you another picture of that momentarily. So that's what this place looks like. It's, it's a beautiful place. It's a great place for receptions, and you can rent the place for receptions. And its primary use right now is as a horse racing museum, for reasons I'll get into. This is a cemetery, uh, quite small. Uh, the fence around it and that concrete wall around it, that's all relatively new. And I wouldn't be surprised if graves expanded beyond that small uh, cluster there because 
it was occupied for a long time and you know, most of the family likely was buried there. But you'll notice in the background, modern tract houses. You'll see more of that in a moment. Uh, I stole a couple of pictures off the internet um, showing what a couple of the rooms look like now that it's been restored. When I first visited the site in 1990, you know, it wasn't being used, paint was peeling from the walls. It just looked terrible. Uh, you wouldn't want to live in there if you were a rat. Uh, but now it's beautifully done with period uh, wall treatments and furnishings, um, period rooms. Uh, but again, a lot of the building is devoted to uh, horse racing, the history of horse racing in Maryland. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, that painting above the fireplace on the left, I don't know if it's a, an original or not, but I suspect that's of uh, uh, Benjamin Tasker, who oversaw the construction of this building in the 1740s. So a couple of the uh, ideas that are kind of running all this. Benjamin Tasker uh, oversaw construction while his newly minted son-in-law, Samuel Ogle, was off uh, with uh, Tasker's daughter on a trip to Europe. Uh, so while they were gone, Tasker oversaw the construction of the house, complete with racing stables and uh, all the accoutrements of a working plantation. Samuel Ogle's son uh, inherited the plantation, uh, albeit uh, there were several caretakers in between because he was quite young when his father died. And it's really during Benjamin Ogle's um, uh, tenancy of the plantation that it probably started to shift in the 1770s from a sort of a, an elite place where you invite uh, prominent um, people in the, in the, to stay with you, um, sort of a show place, and gradually changing it to more of a working plantation. Uh, Benjamin died in 1809 and is buried somewhere in Eastport, the Eastport part of Annapolis where he had another farm, uh, exactly where nobody knows. And it went through a series of other owners until 1898, when a guy named James Woodward purchased Bel Air. Uh, Woodward was from um, uh, this area, from the Anne Arundel, actually from Anne Arundel County, or Prince George's, I don't recall. He's from the area. But he had moved up to New York City, where he'd become a big business person, became quite wealthy, never married. Uh, so when he died in 1910, uh, his nephew, William Woodward, uh, inherited the place. And then when William Sr. died in, eight, in 1953, uh, his son inherited in 55, uh, And William Jr. died in 1955. Um, he had the misfortune of being shot to death by his wife, um, believed to have been an accident. But those of us who are married <laughs> will always wonder. Uh, the place was going into disrepair. And in 1957, the Levitt brothers purchased Bel Air Mansion and the whole plantation, which I think at that time was probably still around 2,500 acres, and built a Levitt town. Uh, the Levitt brothers, after World War II, built these very extensive suburban track neighborhoods with Houses that all look like one another, uh, and to this day they're referred to as Levitt Towns after the original on Long Island, just down the road from where I grew up. Uh, and eventually, in uh, they, um, the Levitts gave Bel Air Mansion to the city of Bowie to serve as a city hall, eventually as a police department, and they gave it up in 1978. So for a number of years, it remained empty, and. Uh, a local group got together and pushed, and eventually the city, uh, uh, with help from the state of Maryland, uh, restored the place, and it is what it is today. So, and the thing is, all these things that are happening, all these transitions from elite plantation to more of a working plantation to more of a farm uh, operated by hired laborers rather than slaves, a variety of crops, 
uh, to the Woodward occupation where they're mostly focused on raising racehorses. So three of the governors involved in all this, first of all, Benjamin Tasker Sr. Uh, he again oversaw construction of uh, the mansion in the 1740s. For his son-in-law, Samuel Ogle, uh, he, Samuel Ogle was uh, periodically governor. I mean, governorships in Maryland, especially proprietary Maryland, uh, well, actually during the state period too, they lasted for two or three years. And he was intermittently the governor of the colony of Maryland uh, in 1731, 1732, and then Lord Baltimore, uh, uh, Charles Calvert showed up in the colony and ran things for a while. And then his son, Benjamin Ogle, served as governor in 1798 to 1801. But at that point, of course, we're an independent nation. So Benjamin Ogle was a state of Maryland governor rather than a proprietary governor. Um, the proprietary governors answered to Lord Baltimore. And technically, the proprietary governors weren't governors, they were lieutenant governors. Lord Baltimore, whether he was in, in, the, in um, North America or not, technically would have been the governor. And then we have three bankers and businessmen who were involved later in the history of the place. James T. Woodward, uh, who again acquired it in um, 1898. Uh, still lived in New York and would come down and uh, enjoy the place as a retreat, but also start uh, to restore the place. William Woodward, who took over uh, in 1910, and he's probably responsible for most of the changes to Bel Air that I'll be talking about this evening. He died in 53. His son inherited, uh, but his son died in 1955. Um, and both of his sons uh, committed suicide over the years. So, um, you know, basically the whole, what was left of Bel Air Plantation was sold again to the Levitt brothers. So those are the characters involved. There we go. We have here in 1884, um, uh, I guess it was a lithograph. I can't tell it's such a bad reproduction. But it shows the north side of the, of the uh, mansion. And so you can you see on the east, on the west side, we've got a pair of chimneys. And actually, I guess there's two on the east side as well. There's a one, two one-story additions on the west side. And this was by a prominent illustrator of the time, a guy named Mayer. Uh, his drawings were actually, I actually stumbled over them in the state law library years ago in their special collections area, they were just lying around in a folder and they were the original drawings. So uh, actually quite an interesting find. I should have photographed them. Again, on the left is Ogle Hall, which is in Annapolis. And on the right is uh, Bel Air. But you will notice that, you know, you've got this pair of chimneys here. There's no addition on this side in 1904. And on the other side, you could just barely make out a two-story addition. So sometime between 1884, when Mayer did his drawing, and 1904, there were some significant changes made to this building, basically removal here and addition over here. The, a lot of the changes were made probably between uh, 1910 and 1914. And it was done by the architectural firm of Delano and Aldrich. They were big in the so-called Beaux-Arts School of Architecture. That is kind of federal and Georgian style, you know, very formal uh, stuff with a little more flair, kind of modernized, uh, very big in the Washington DC area. Um, a lot of our buildings in, uh, around uh, Smithsonian Mall or Beaux-Arts in design. But they were based in New York and they had some heavy hitting clients. The Rockefeller family, the Astors, the Vanderbilts, the Whitney's, they were big time. And they had some very prestigious clients in the form in terms of institutions. Uh, they built a number of embassies for the United States government. 
uh, did a lot of work on at Yale University, uh, did some work at Cornell University, the famous Knickerbocker Club in New York, and even our, the Walters Art Museum in downtown Baltimore. So these guys did a lot of work, um, they're very prominent in the field. But they were retained by uh, William Woodward Sr. in 1914 to extensively restore, uh, enhance perhaps the mansion and also the grounds. And I guess they're also responsible for the garden that appears next to Bel Air Mansion, which was a <clears throat> series of concentric circles and radiating paths, a greenhouse, um, you know, kind of high-end type of uh, fancy garden. Ah, come on, you. There we go. Here we have an aerial view of the uh, Bel Air Mansion and the, the, all this uh, cultivated area around it. This is all part of Bel Air. But the house is in the middle at the end of this very long, that, you can still see that driveway today, the very long driveway that kind of loops in front of uh, the house. Here's the mansion. And here are the terraces. I have a close-up of that. Here we go. This is a close-up of the 1938 aerial photograph. It's kind of blurry because resolution wasn't great, but here you can see that loop driveway. The house, which by this point, 1938, has an L and hyphens at each end. We have that fancy garden, and we have the terraces. We have the main terrace, a small terrace, and two medium, three medium-sized terraces. And here you can see it. Um, much later, I don't have the date on this offhand, let me see. No, I forgot what date it is, but here you can see, this is basically the property now. And if we um, zero in on it, oops. This is a LIDAR image. Uh, those of you who have attended these talks before know, you know LIDAR is a, a system of remote sensing from aircraft and satellites that uh, emits electromagnetic radiation towards the ground, it bounces back and allows us to look at the topography, the contours of the land without interference from trees, because you could simply eliminate uh, anything that's above, you know, several feet above the ground. And so what we've got here again is now that much reduced loop driveway. This is from the last couple of years. Uh, I think that's Bel Air Drive there. And the house is here, the mansion's here. And these are the terraces. You see a big terrace, the step of it right in front of the house, a steep riser, a very narrow step, steep riser. And now just two of these lower terraces, there was a third that was destroyed when these houses were built. So this is Levittown. This is all Levittown built around. Uh, Bel Air. A closer look. You get, again, you can see a very broad terrace up here. And when you go out there, it's just like, it's like a big pool table, quite flat. Uh, I haven't measured this, but it looks like it's uh, sort of a conventional golden rule kind of uh, dimensions. A uh, very narrow terrace, is, terrace at the base of a very steep riser. You know, the shorter but steep riser. And then again, these two terraces. So this is all done by slave labor, massive project, but they basically sculpted the hillside and it's looking southward down into, um, into the valley. So you get a, would have gotten an incredible panoramic view. Nowadays you see, you know, Levittown. This is a map showing what the area looks like today. All these purple polygons, those are all houses built. But still with the topography, you can see that the house up here is built on a hill, sloping to the north, you know, in all four cardinal directions. And you can also see those terraces. This is just a classic uh, golden age of Maryland uh, plan, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, a, a fancy Palladian mansion, which is based on Roman principles, on this very heavily terraced landscape. So it sits up almost like uh, the Acropolis looking above Athens.
Americans. That's the idea. It's supposed to be very prominent. In uh, 1944, this is uh, the topographic map of the area. Here's just uh, left and up of center is Bel Air Mansion. Over here, this U-shaped building, uh, these are the stables that uh, Delano and Aldrich built in 1914 uh, for the Woodwards. But you can see the little black spots are houses. They're by no means all the buildings that were present at that time. They're used by the US Geological Survey as landmarks in creating this map. But you can see it's a fairly rural area. And the same thing in um, 1958. Uh, it's not a heavily settled area until you get off to the other side of the railroad tracks. There's even what looks like a little mill pond here uh, south of uh, the house. But again, you know, after the Levitts buy the whole plantation, they develop it and becomes a you know, very chock-a-block type uh, suburban community. So let's talk about the archaeology now. <clears throat> I was not the first one on the scene. Uh, the historic preservation person for Prince George's County years ago, Susan Pearl, uh, did a lot of excavation with volunteers. Uh, Stephen Israel, now retired from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, a professional archaeologist, did some work here mostly with, I think, Susan Pearl kind of helping out. Uh, ours was the first, and there are a couple of episodes of uh, uh, my team working here, but um, we were really the first professional, sustained professional effort at uh, doing archaeology at Bel Air Mansion. And you can see in the upper left, this is again before restoration. Uh, you can see the driveway comes pretty much up to the steps leading into the house. And this would be the southern aspect with the terraces. In the lower left, uh, not obvious to anybody looking at this place in 1990, there was this essentially a trench running along the front of the house. And, and you know, it's not just, just a trench, it was, it was a purposeful construction, so what we call an area way. And uh, you sometimes see these in urban settings, you know, stairs that go down and give you entry into the basement, uh, direct entry into the basement. And that's what they had here at Bel Air. All this area in front of uh, the mansion house was open uh, for, I don't know, five, six, seven feet. And there was a wall there, now recently replaced with concrete block, but there would have been a brick wall here and steps going down and a brick floor. And that would take you under the current steps through a door into the basement. This is essentially the servant's entrance. And it was one means of getting stores into the building, casks of wine, you know, all kinds of um, manufactured goods shipped in from Europe mostly, and they'd be stored in the basement of the house. The lower right image is a partial drawing of what we have, and that's a, this is a stone wall, mortared stone wall with brick above, and this, the mortar actually has these little pebbles pushed into it. Uh, it's called galloting. It's just a decorative thing but it draws a considerable contrast between this very naturalistic stone wall and very formal uh, brick above it. It's like this contrast between uh, nature and, and the artificial, nature and culture. And I think that's kind of served symbolically, you know, the servants, mostly slaves, enslaved Africans, they'd be going down through the, the nature part of this thing and the family, and all their services would be provided in the brick part of the building above grade. Uh, also in this thing, you can't see in this photograph, you could see perhaps uh, in the lower left-hand corner, this little brick thing with a hole in it. That's part of a downspout for the gutters. And the gutters, actually one of them has a date 1747 on it. But the downspouts come into these things, these boots, and it takes it, the water down below the brick floor of this areaway. And there are actually a, uh, two systems of culverts beneath the brick floor that would take the storm water off the roof, underneath the floor, and out towards the west, going down quite a ways. My guess is they led eventually to a cistern that would store water for the house. Uh, we never have found it, but I'm pretty sure it's out there somewhere. 
And the, this again is something we see a lot of on uh, 18th century mansion sites, both rural and urban. In fact, you all often hear about tunnels around these things and about being part of the uh, underground railroad for escaping slaves. Well, when you actually excavate these things, you can see they're so small, a, a very small child could barely get through them. Uh, and also when they're built, it's pretty obvious to everybody that these things are being built, they're not a secret. So when you hear about these tunnels around these houses, they're stormwater drains, nothing more uh, exciting than that. So here's a, a, our drawing of the thing, the footprint of it, you know, looking down from below so you can see on uh, the left-hand side wall around it, you see a nice square wall, but there's this curved brick structure here and that is an arched brick drain. That was the original drain for this house. And towards the center, you could see more bricks here and here. But that's part of a replacement drain. Eventually the uh, arched one uh, failed. And so it was replaced by a simple post and lentil type. So you're stacking up bricks, putting bricks on top and that creates this little tunnel for the water. Um, I'm gonna to try to read this. This is uh, an interesting description we have of the house. Benjamin Tasker died in 1768. And so the property was put up for sale, although eventually purchased by uh, Samuel Ogle's son, Benjamin. And I'll, don't bother reading this, I'll read it for you. This is just part of what's in here. This is essentially an ad trying to sell the place. Quote, formerly the property and residence of the late Governor Ogle, deceased, also about 21 slaves, all the stock, household, and kitchen furniture, plows, tools, etc. This estate contains about 2,177 acres, including a quantity of mowable meadow and a large portion of arable land, which is well enclosed, and wheat was sown last autumn on part of it. The mansion house and office near it are two stories built of brick, the latter about 40 feet square, and the former 60 by 35 feet. The orchards, gardens, stables, barns, etc., also contribute to, I can't read the word, this seat, very pleasing and commodious. So there's a couple of things we can get out of this. There's meadow land, which probably wasn't much good for general agriculture, but was good for growing grass to, as pasture for uh, cattle and horses. A large portion of arable land, kind of redundant, arable means land, means land you can cultivate. It's well enclosed, so it's fenced. And wheat was sown last autumn on part of it. Uh, a lot of the farms and plantations, a lot of the farms throughout Southern Maryland did not grow wheat until you get down to lower St. Mary's County. Those, especially in this part of Prince George's County, grew mostly tobacco. So wheat was kind of exceptional and it seems to be one of those crops in the 18th century that were grown largely by wealthier people with lots of land. Uh, we know Governor Horatio Sharp and his plantation outside of Annapolis in the 1750s and later uh, also grew uh, wheat, raised uh, sheep for wool, didn't grow a single leaf of tobacco. So it seems to be something wealthier folks are engaged in. This is our map of the site, and this is what governed a lot of the archaeology we would do. Now, the area way that we excavated, I think 1990, uh, that was going to be part of the restoration of the house. The brick had to the brick joints had to be cleaned and repointed. Um, they had some water issues they needed to deal with. But then, as they were restoring the interior of the of the house, what they wanted to do was provide some parking because they figured they'd have some visitors, and that's what this dashed line represents the, the new area that would be paved. Uh, up until then, just this area where the driveway is and a little apron around it and these walkways were paved. So our first job was to go in and survey the house lot and see if there are any archeological deposits that would be adversely affected by proposed construction. And we also, um, they also want us to test the terraces, to shovel test the terraces, presumably to look for evidence of the plantings that were there. We were supposed to take pollen samples and all sorts of things. But after we dug a few of these shovel test pits on the terraces and we kept coming up with 20th century pieces of vessel glass, it was pretty obvious. And also the soils were not well weathered. 
it was pretty obvious that these terraces were rebuilt. They're not the original terraces. I assume they were terraces originally, uh, but we don't really know what they look like. These were rebuilt by the architectural firm Delano and Aldridge, probably 1914, probably at the same time this boxwood garden uh, to the right was uh, constructed. These large blobs here, those are all current trees. But we shovel tested in this area, we found a lot of artifacts, uh, a lot of brick, and also we mechanically stripped the stipple area here because we couldn't shovel test, it was paved. Here's the area that was mechanically stripped. This photograph makes it look like it was done in the 1940s, <laughs> but this is 1990, give or take. Uh, it isn't clear enough for me to identify most of the people. I see Paul Mask over here from Calvert County. I got a funny feeling that might be me. Um, and Denise Stevenson, there's a couple of folks here. Uh, but you can see with the machine is taken off the pavement and they're cleaning down the surface and you could see the brick showing up here. There's the remains of some sort of brick foundation. There's not much to it. Uh, it's only a course or two thick. Um, most of it is gone, probably graded away years ago. Just another view, that might be Al Lavish there, also from Calvert County. But you can see, here's a brick running through. Part of my crew, Al Lavish, retired uh, Air Force engineer, Denise Stevenson, retired phys ed teacher, both at the time and they're about 60 years old. And we dug some excavation units. Um, just to you know, get a better sense of the deposits, which we couldn't necessarily get through shovel testing. But you can see each of these produced, if not actual foundation, the base of a foundation that had since been robbed out. Somebody either just demolished it or was salvaging the bricks for something else. But we've got evidence of three separate you know, parts of foundations with just three units. So here's our map, uh, just from um, this scale, you could see uh, the, the small squares are excavation units. The paved area where we found brick foundation is over here. Uh, and we also did some testing on the other side. I don't have that on this particular drawing, but here's a close up of that grid. And you can see our excavation units, what they've exposed, some features, post holes, parts of brick foundations, uh, actually a fence line running through here. So the fence line would have come down through basically through here, and this is the edge of the original building. So we've got evidence of prior structures out in front of the mansion. So the question is, what are those buildings? That quotation I read you, they mentioned a 40 by 40 foot, two-story brick, quote unquote, office. Well, Office was a kind of a catch-all term for pretty much any uh, substantial structure that wasn't actually part of the house. And I can't say we ever found it, or at least we haven't recognized it. In the area, once we did our excavation, you know, we shovel tested, we found evidence of, of um, deposits, we did excavation units, and then we brought in machinery and stripped away the soil. And here you can see in the upper left, very clearly some sort of foundation, parts of it here. This is another view of it over here in our drawing. So it's clearly part of the building there, but so little of it survives. What I found, one of the things I found kind of interesting, and I've seen this on other sites since then, don't know what to make of it, but often with these remnant foundations, they'll sit on top of a patch of burned oyster shell, crushed burned oyster. And that almost certainly is evidence of the undertakers, the, the, the con contractors making oyster shell mortar on site to lay up the brick. And so they're making that mortar and it has just so happens that that happened to be eventually where a foundation would go. The bricks were also probably made on site. Uh, the cellar hole for the mansion, but about big hole, would have produced a lot of silt loam, clay silt loam. That would have been made up into bricks. We've not seen any, any evidence of where those bricks were burned. 
uh, possibly those that evidence has been destroyed. And just another evidence of the structure. This, the, the drawings look a little primitive. This is early on in my uh, learning digital drafting. So they're not quite as polished as they might be today. We found post holes out in the front yard. This is, this is, a, this is some sort of post hole. Not only is this a post hole, but there's another post hole that intruded on it that replaced whatever post was here. So this is the original post hole. And this is a replacement post hole. And that would be where the wooden post was. So there's some sort of something going through here, probably a fence. And then a large, you know, larger type of uh, pit, uh, which probably was a post hole too, just uh, in poor condition. One of the interesting things we found before we stripped all the topsoil away with a uh, um, bulldozer is we found these uh, uh, exposures of soil where you could see stratum one in both of these is the topsoil that's developed over the 20th century. Right underneath was stratum two, which is, was a dense deposit of brick rubble, mortar, and lots and lots of artifacts. This is demolition debris. Stratum two is at some point, somebody bulldozed structures, leveled off the area, perhaps probably removes mo most of the larger materials. But this is the result. This is a demolition layer. It sits on top of stratum three, which would have been the topsoil at, at, the, at the time these structures were just being bulldozed. So, Stratum three has actually been encapsulated. It's been uh, blanketed by this demolition debris. So stratum three is a deposit that, uh, and four, these are deposits that probably date to the 18th, the mid 18th through mid to late 19th centuries. Some of the artifacts we recovered from stratum two included fragments of this of glass you can see here these are a part of a larger structure and the glass edge has been folded over you can see it better in the drawing especially in this profile here this these are parts of uh, a cloche uh, a bell jar uh, these couple I pulled off the internet um, I think these are both French examples but you can see especially on the one on the right the glass has been folded over to give it the characteristic rim these are items that were very uh, widely used in these, on these elite plantations in the gardens because uh, they're like mini greenhouses and would have been used to uh, cultivate plants that would not otherwise survive in our temperate winters here, temperate to subtropical uh, winters. So, you know, exotic plants were being grown. And so what we've got, this is almost like a flower pot that we're finding out in the, in the yard. It's evidence of somebody growing plants for other than uh, commercial purposes. This is, these are garden plants. We also recovered, uh, I've reconstructed it with a drawing because it was pretty broken up, but a gray stoneware, an American stoneware uh, pan. Uh, you get an idea, there's a scale there. So it's, oh, I'd say about nine, 10 inches in diameter. Uh, these things would have been pop, uh, common in early 19th century kitchens for making bread dough, even washing stuff, but they also might have been used as planters. Uh, very simply decorated with, you know, in this case, a couple of in blue, these uh, leaves are part of a flower here. Uh, so this could be part, this could conceivably be part of the uh, uh, gardening uh, out in that yard area. And all this stuff is coming from strata, basically strata two and three. Some of the artifacts we found, in, especially in stratum two, a Chinese porcelain cup in the upper left-hand corner, the better part of a white salt glazed stoneware plate. Um, uh, pretty much in the Midlands of England and also up in Scotland, Southern Scotland. Uh, in the 18th century from oh, the 17 teens um, 
up until about 1800. They don't really show up on sites around here after 1800. Uh, but that would have been the first truly matched ceramic wares that we would have. You know, if you look in your cabinets today in your kitchen, you probably have matched dinnerwares. Well, those things were only available starting in the early 18th century, and even then only to the wealthier folks. It would have been pretty expensive. Um, and they would have come in all sorts of, you know, plates of different sizes and cups and saucers and all sorts of stuff. The Chinese porcelain on the left is almost certainly 18th century, uh, of course, imported from China, would have been expensive. And if memory serves, the museum at Bel Air actually has a complete example of exactly this cup with that pattern. I don't recall where they got it. it might have been dug up. Below that is a classic um, stoneware, uh, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, you've got this large uh, stoneware, British made stoneware mug. Uh, I've seen, I've shown pictures of these exactly this kind of vessel on pretty much every talk I've given on an 18th century site. Uh, they were very common. Uh, on households of all levels of wealth. In the lower right-hand corner, fragments of Chinese porcelain plates, uh, almost certainly predating 1830, uh, somewhere between, let's say, 1750 and 1830. And there's a lot of this stuff. Uh, these folks had some very nice uh, furnishings for their table, uh, not stuff that you wouldn't necessarily see on other sites, but a hell of a lot more than you would see on other sites. Uh, very little in the way of cheaper coarser wares that are more typical on sites of uh, less wealthy households. We also found, I think we've got two of these actually, these are glass bottle seals. And so, you know, think of a wine bottle and even today, sometimes they'll find that you'll see a seal on the outside, kind of a raised seal. Um, they're made separate from the bottle, and then when both are hot, they're kind of welded together. And this one has mm -hmm. the initial B for Benjamin and Ogle. Uh, these are personalized wine bottles ordered in England and delivered empty to the plantation. Uh, as I've talked about uh, before uh, in several of the talks, most of the wine was actually shipped in barrels of varying sizes to the colonies. So you purchased barrels of the stuff, rolled them down a ramp or down that area away into your cellar and stored it there and then filled the bottles from the casks. So the wine was uh, largely aged in the cask and decanted into bottles. In terms of, it wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be one of my talks if, if, if if we didn't have a table or two, but if we look at all those sherds, uh, glass and ceramic sherds, not trying to vesselize them, we're not trying to figure out the minimum number of vessels present and the shapes that are present. This is just a raw count of ceramic sherds and glass sherds. But implied in the activities I have listed on the left, there's some, it's implied that we're, we're actually identifying forms, you know, mugs and cups as opposed to plates, etc., and cooking vessels. But if you look at the raw numbers, especially in the left-hand column for the totals of glass and ceramic, out of almost 3,600 sherds, almost 2,500 of them are from wine and liquor consumption, as wine bottles, wine glasses, beer mugs, that sort of stuff. Uh, but there are other things, food, uh, food presentation, that would be, you know, the Chinese porcelain cups, for instance, and food consumption would be cups and plates and whatnot. But the vast majority of the material we've got, roughly two thirds of it, is some drinking vessels, alcoholic drinking vessels. So here's a footprint of the house. And again, here's that areaway which goes underneath these stairs, it'd be a, it's sort of an arch here. It goes right under, and there, doesn't show in here because I guess they didn't open it up at the time or when this was drawn, the architect didn't realize that there was a door here that had been filled in. But the area away would take you into this vaulted ceiling 
essentially like a, well, not like a wine cellar, it was a wine cellar. And also uh, buried beneath this addition, this 20th century addition, there was another door, a wide door that you could also bring in stuff. So this entire space in the cellar, maybe a portion was used for a kitchen during the winter. The large portion of the underside of this house, the undercroft, was for storing goods, uh, not just wine and rum, but food uh, stores of various uh, kinds, textiles, basically anything that would be bought in bulk. And it would supply the household. It would supply their labor force, which was you know, largely slaves. And they probably, I think a lot of these planters also sold to local farmers. Uh, you know, the, the ships come in, um, from Europe at a certain time of the year to load up with uh, grain and tobacco and bring it back to the old world. Well, in between uh, they're coming and going, you would need stores, you would need uh, mercantiles to sell stuff. But these plantation houses, I think also served as commercial stores, mercantiles selling to local planters, another way of making a few bucks. So what do we have here? We got this huge building and, and it's big and it's open to the public uh, as a museum. I really encourage you to go see it. It's right off Route 50, uh, just a, a mile or two off uh, Maryland 3 and uh, Maryland 197, it's easy to find. Especially if you're interested in horse racing. Again, it's a horse racing museum for the most part, but what we've learned is, okay, we've got construction in the 1740s. Uh, we know there was an addition, a brick addition of some two-story building, which we either have not found or have found and simply not recognized. And presumably other outbuildings that would have served uh, the mansion. We have an addition of a one-story, one, two one-story buildings really sometime between 1771 when Tasker's advertisement went out. And 1884, when we have the Meyer drawing that shows those two one-story buildings. All the additions appear to have been demolished between 1904 and 1914. Actually, I bet you could put most of between 1910 and 1914. And that demolition accounts for that stratum too that we see across the front yard of the mansion where we recovered all of those 18th century artifacts. Um, we have the addition of flanking L's and wings to achieve that five-part Palladian design, which was the ideal in the 18th century. Um, and I'll show you an image of that in a moment. Um, but it's done in the 20th century. And it was done as what, part of what we call a revival style, a colonial or Georgian revival, where this is after our, our centennial celebration, 1876. There's a great deal of interest in the colonial period. Uh, and so there we get colonial revival architecture. A lot of small houses, houses of all sort built trying to evoke uh, colonial design. But with these mansion sites that were definitely built in the 18th century, they were kind of, they were already colonial, but they were kind of adding to it to make it, I guess, more colonial, uh, if you will. And these kinds of sites, these mansion sites are really popular uh, after the centennial, uh, well into uh, through the first quarter of the 20th century. Lots of wealthy folks, politicians coming to Washington uh, to serve their constituencies would need to rent or buy a house. And they particularly sought buildings like this to enhance their, their stature uh, amongst fellow elite. Uh, they go out and look for these Palladian sites. And, and that's what the Woodwards did. Uh, they, they bought a bit of history. Uh, the, the terraces were clearly rebuilt, uh, almost certainly by Delano and Aldrich for William Woodward Sr. So we get demolition of buildings uh, and those, the, the demolition has left a couple of things. It's left uh, traces of footprints of earlier buildings that show actually a, a kind of congested yard there. If you go back to this image here, um, you've seen this map. I've drawn this blue dashed line. This blue dashed line links a whole bunch of post holes and molds. There was a uh, probably a uh, uh, post and rail fence 
that ran across the yard. And here you can see it barely, I've, I've reproduced that line here, running more or less to the corner of the original part of the building. So this is probably a 19th century fence or earlier. These red ellipses, one here, one here, show the remains of brick foundations. That's where we found brick foundations. So there are some additional structures out here. Seemingly relatively small, probably not completely brick. Um, we don't know what they were used for. Uh, this site had been, when they demolished the site, uh, they graded over a lot of the stuff. So we're really just looking at a remnant of what was there. Uh, getting back to uh, the summary, uh, that demolition layer left uh, encapsulated a large number of largely 18th century artifacts from the people who lived at Bel Air. Uh, mind you, the people who used those artifacts to prepare and serve dinners and who washed and put away the plates afterwards, they were almost all, they were all slaves uh, in the 18th century. And we know in um, the advertisement of 1771 at the time, there were 21 slaves that went along with the plantation, which actually sounds pretty light given the number, uh, given the size of the plantation and the size of the house. I would imagine that if there were, there were more enslaved people working on the plantation, but maybe they didn't belong to Tasker, maybe they belonged to his wife, or maybe he rented slaves. But 21 doesn't seem anywhere near enough for a place that large. We're probably looking at two, three, four times that number. And, but anyway, those artifacts tell us something about their lives in that mansion. I mean, they were using pretty fancy ceramics at the time, which is what we'd expect from an elite residence a place where you invite guests to stay for weeks, sometimes months, uh, an opportunity to introduce your kids to the kids of other elites. So uh, you're, hopefully your kids will at least marry people of the same uh, so social wealth and social prestige and preferably higher, advancing the fortunes of the family. And you get evidence of cultivating gardens, you know, specifically with those cloche fragments. Um, that really, that's, that says something uh, about what these folks are trying to do. They're not just growing food, they're not just growing commercial crops, they're actually doing exotic plantings. And of course, you know, those, um, uh, those terraces really drive that home. And then we get, uh, again, the, the stratigraphy there where we get the stuff encapsulated. Uh, really eliminating, you know, 20th century stuff is really just in stratum one. Stratum two is 18th and 19th century, late 18th to 19th. And most of it um, appears to be 18th century. Um, why there's so much trash out there? I mean, we can explain the brick rubble, but it's a little harder to explain. Why is there all that trash out there? Why, you know, I haven't even mentioned animal bone yet. What's all that stuff doing in the front yard? Uh, not sure we'll ever know. So anyway, you know, these are the kinds of things we've learned and the site by itself isn't hugely interesting. That's not really the key here. The thing is that um, uh, it's, we can take what we've learned from the site and compare it to other mansion sites. Um, I've worked at Riverdale Mansion up there, the, uh, University of Maryland College Park. And hopefully this fall, one of the talks I give will be about um, Riverdale, the home of George and, uh, uh, oh God, what's her name? Rose Calvert. Um, we, and we've got other, uh, other, these fat, other these plantation sites that have been dug up in uh, Anne Arundel and Prince George's counties primarily. So we can compare what we've learned from one with one with, it, with the, uh, what we've learned from other sites. Anyway, that's about all I have to say, and I'm more than happy to answer questions. Don't you find that bit about um, uh, these wealthy planters planting wheat in an area where everybody else is growing tobacco? You read my mind. <laughs> it's not um, hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very transparent. Um, yeah, I, th I thought that comment was interesting because the numbers that I'm looking at, there is quite a bit of what they called winter wheat 
which I assume that if they were planning this in the fall, is that's what. Yeah, that that's what for. it is. Um, I I thought it, it was more prevalent than than you had indicated. Uh, probably not in the 18th century, but that's one of the interesting things to research. You know, how many small farmers grew winter wheat, and did they do it just for home use? You know, just bring it back down to a local mill uh, for you know home use, and for larger farms, you're also feeding uh, your labor force again, mostly slaves. Uh, but you know, tobacco, most of Southern Maryland was so profoundly devoted to tobacco. Um, you know, you see a lot more weed around today because we don't grow tobacco around here anymore. Uh, but historically, most of the wheat in Southern Maryland was grown in Southern uh, St. Mary's County and the Eastern Shore, and then later on, you know, going into Western Maryland. So, so what, what quantity of wheat would be required above subsistence? You know, what would you consider one where you're growing it commercially as opposed to just for your own use? I don't know. I haven't researched that, but I would say your average farm family probably goes, probably went through five, 10 pounds of flour a day. You know, same thing with things like eggs. You know, they'd be, you know, going through a couple dozen eggs a day would not be a big deal for your average farm family. Yeah. Um, you know, this is what they eat. And they're also feeding laborers too. So, um, but yeah, that'd be an interesting. Yeah, how many? What constitutes subsistence wheat farming uh, versus growing wheat for mm. specifically for commercial purpose? Because you can have surplus wheat and sell it in a small amount. Gets combined with wheat from a bunch of other small farmers, but that's not the you know above and beyond your needs. But that's not the same as growing wheat commercially. Yeah. Do you have any idea how much, how many pounds of flour would come out of a bushel of wheat? No idea. Yeah. There's an experiment there for somebody. <laughs> there's probably there's probably some literature on the subject. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. What okay. what was the well a question and a comment? Uh, John Beale Boardsley was the um, experimented with wheat production on um, Y Island. And that's one of the things that took him to um, up to Philadelphia where he kept, kept um, all of his agronomistic um, endeavors. But he was one of the first to, to actually try to grow wheat commercially on Y Island uh, in the 1780s or I, I don't know the date, but um, uh, that in that period, um, but my question was about the closest place where it, uh, product could be shipped in and shipped out to uh, Bel Air. What would have been the the port that? Well, well uh, part of that advertisement uh, I, I left out uh, out of my quotation part of the advertisement, which says it's 16 miles distant from Annapolis, and mm -hmm. the same for Bladensburg and also six miles from Queen Anne. Now, if you listen to the talk I gave on a, a William Gove Plantation down in Bowie, that's, that was uh, sort of on the way down to Queen Anne. Queen Anne was on the Patuxent River and was a bustling little port. Uh, I, would, I would guess much of what they got came from Queen Anne, through Queen Anne. But Bladensburg uh, was a major port. And of course, stuff could have been brought overland from Annapolis. My guess is um, stuff was coming and going in all three directions, mm. but probably certain things went to one port and certain things to another port. And Annapolis would have been a likely source of a lot of um, you know, more expensive goods that were being brought to the plantation. Partly because you know, the Ogles had a house, they had a townhouse. So, I mean, they were there anyway, it wouldn't have been a big deal you know, when they're heading off to their uh, plantation in the spring to cart along a lot of stuff that came in through Annapolis. Yeah. The Philadelphia connection with uh, uh, Bordley uh, is kind of interesting because Philadelphia and Baltimore were at war with one another for decades about capturing the interior 
markets, agri agricultural markets, mostly for wheat. So it's funny that he should bypass Baltimore. <laughs> but what, what year, you, you said what, 1770s? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I think it was probably uh, 1770s, uh, 1780s that he, he went up there after, yeah. you know, um, experimenting on Y Island. Yeah, Baltimore was just getting off the ground at the time. Philadelphia was well mm -hmm. established. But uh, within a couple of decades of that, um, both of them were sizable towns and they were competing for largely the wheat trade because they would buy up the wheat from farmers. You know, they would ship some of it in, in barrels, but a lot of it would be ground into flour and shipped down the Eastern seaboard and out to the Caribbean. So it was a major commodity around here. Thanks. Sure.